Hello, my name is Mi Kam. Mm. I am a professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm the vice chairman of the Department of Geography and Resource Management and director of the Urban Studies Program. I'm also an associate director of the Institute of Future Cities, where I run um, the Center for Community and Place Governance. So I would like to welcome you to the fourth International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism. So while I look forward to learning from you all, I will also share in my keynote speech a topic related to urbanism. I will talk about people's rights to the development of space and place in our cities. Why is this important? It is because this will directly affect our physical, emotional, psychological, and social well-being. So I hope you will enjoy the conference and may I wish the conference every success. Right, today I'm going to talk about uh, people's right to spatial development for multifaceted well-being. Um, it's very important for us to have the right to shape the space, you know, that shapes us. As David Harvey argues, people's right to spatial development is the right to change ourselves by changing the city. So a right to shape spatial development is important because space enables our multifaceted well-being and doing this will also shape our shared human dignity so what is this human dignity it's very important it's the absolute inner world of a person uh, it's an ability for us recognizing that each of us can think conceptually we can deliberate we can discuss and we can make free choices it's a natural ability to shape our own lives Right, so dignity is the moral basis of our shared humanity. Now, uh, for full moral respect of human dignity, we need to do this. If we understand that shaping spaces will enable our multifaceted well-being, right? So we, if we understand this, so we need to also make ourselves, you know, um, responsible, to be responsible for other people's dignity. So that means we have to take actions, although we may be limited by our time, by our resources, or by competing moral demand, we have this, you know, uh, uh, responsibility to have to shape the space so that other people can flourish as well, so that they can also develop their best you know, potential. So in other words, we do have this imperfect obligation to have the flourishing of others in order to realize our shared human dignity. So the right to spatial development, therefore, is the right to live a flourishing life with dignity. And you and I have the right and also the responsibility to shape spaces so that we can all achieve this multifaceted well-being. So this multifaceted well-being is equivalent to human flourishing and this well-being According to the World Health Organization, health is not just about, you know, no um, disease or no infirmity. Uh, health is actually a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. All right. And this is our fundamental rights. It's a fundamental human right without any distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic and social condition. So I want to introduce this settlement health map. It helps us to appreciate that we all live, you know, among ourselves uh, in our local community, which is embedded within the bigger built environment and the natural environment and also the global, you know, situation. And there are different types of well-being that we need to pay attention to, like physical well-being, emotional well-being, psychological well-being, and social well-being. And for physical well-being, we understand, you know, that uh, we need to eat well, we need to sleep well, we need to do exercises. And how can we encourage people to do more exercises? Then we need to shape our spaces into more active spaces, like, you know, a lot of uh, sidewalks, 
uh, improving the walkability of the place. It's also very important when we build uh, our recreational spaces, it's going to be inclusive, that you know, people can enjoy it uh, you know, with their various kinds of abilities. Another kind of well-being is what we call emotional well-being. Now, emotional well-being sometimes has to do with our human biology. Some people are born happier, cheerful. Other people seem to be more, uh, you know, pessimistic. But uh, if we provide a nicer environment, it will nevertheless, you know, uh, boost uh, people's uh, feeling of the place and make them happier. So uh, this concept of biophilia, you know, this like our affinity to nature. So the building of a green Green settings is very important because uh, green settings have the capacity to alleviate our mental fatigue and also restore our capacity to pay attention. So some places draw people together and that, you know, when they come together, they will have abilities to uh, develop their ties and social capital. Also, places that encourage physical activity can very effectively prevent and treat uh, depression. So settings like these just make you feel very calm, recharge your energy. Another kind of well-being is what we call psychological well-being. It has to do with our relationship with others. Uh, if we have positive relationship with others, that we can master the environment and being autonomous, we will accept ourselves more and find purpose in life and also have personal growth. Like Professor Kawachi and his uh, colleagues uh, argue that social capital actually affects our health, our well-being, because through the exchange of network based resources, such as cycle, uh, social support, collective actions um, of in the built environment that will allow us, will provide opportunities for us to interact and also promote investment in a shared space. So like uh, in spaces like this, people come together with different uh, abilities. Uh, they can actually uh, feel like more mastery of the environment. They can develop positive relationships and experience growth together. Okay, and then the social well-being is also very important. So the emotional and the psychological well-being is about the person, but if people experience that kind of connection with people and connection with the environment, uh, they will actually uh, they together will promote social well-being, uh, they will accept one another, they can actualize their potentials, they can contribute to society, and they can be sort of more uh, integrated with, uh, you know, the bigger community. Like Professor Hugh Barton argued that social inclusion is critical for health, and it's related to place qualities or place inequity. So uh, accessible, inclusive transportation, affordable housing, safe neighborhoods, these are very important ingredients in spatial development, and these will also play a very crucial role in shaping social inclusion. Uh, so therefore, uh, health. So location, urban form, environmental characteristics are very important for good or ill. Uh, like, you know, Professor Cresswell said, place is a kind of necessary social construction something that we have to construct in order to be human, right? So this is our uh, human dignity that we come together and we construct this space. And we hope when we construct this space, it's going to promote multifaceted well-being. It's going to uh, flourish everyone that is, you know, facilitating our shared human humanity. Uh, as Professor Barton argues that there is no longer any doubt that spatial planning has a critical role to play in promoting health and well-being. Now, what are the implications when we shape spaces? So this right to physical well-being means that for architects, for planners, we have to create place qualities that will promote physical well-being. We need to uh, create places for emotional and also psychological and social well-being as well. Um, say, for example, allowing private uh, spaces, right? Uh, you cannot really uh, um, allow people to live in too cramped an area. 
uh, you need we need to provide blue green infrastructure so that people can satisfy their needs. Uh, they are drawn to this green environment because of our biophilia nature. Uh, and this blue green infrastructure can also draw people together so that they can develop social capital. So this socio pental um, spaces, spaces that allow people to come together is also very important for our, uh, you know, uh, well-being. Uh, complete neighborhoods, right, allowing people to satisfy their needs uh, within like 20 minutes neighborhood is a very important. Or building streets which are not just for cars, but streets with pedestrians, with cycling, uh, with trees and with economic activities is a very important to boost our social well-being or like building walkable neighborhoods with a lot of uh, sit sitting out areas or even uh, economic activities. Uh, community farms also very important. Uh, local markets, uh, you know, allowing economic activities, but at, at the same time also accumulation of social capital or public spaces, public rent for play, they are, you know, very important. So I hope to conclude uh, in this talk, um, you can realize the importance of our responsibility and our right to spatial development because these will actually directly affect our multifaceted well-being. And when we shape the space, we need to provide, you know, privacy spaces for people to retreat a little bit, even in the public domain. Uh, very important for us to provide green spaces, biophilia spaces, biophilic design, you know, bringing nature into our spaces. If you cannot do it, at least, you know, bring something that simulates, you know, nature in our design that would also help or we should also provide a lot of socio-pantal spaces so that people can pump into one another, they can develop social ties, social capital, and make sure that all the spaces are going to be socially inclusive. That's what I want to share. Thank you.